Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to today's live stream. Um, I'm Monica Wahi, and I'm here today to start showing you some really cool plots. And this is part of my um, great R packages for health data analytics, and it's my R tricks for SaaS users. So, oh, welcome, Ari Kant. I'm glad you're here. Um, oh, make sure that you download the slides. Everybody download the slides because guess what I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you some links, right? So on the screen right now, um, the the uh, slides that I'm sharing, you'll see there's four plots. Okay, not four plots, four plots, right? There's this Likert plot, this upset plot, this dumbbell plot, and the scree plot. And these are unusual plots. They're not the ones you normally see in biostatistics. I want to make sure that you follow our company page and find out because I'm going to be doing the live stream. Today, we're going to cover this plot here, this Likert plot, but we're going to cover these other ones in the future. And I want to show them to you. I'm I'm going to show you them in R. Um, so I'm a data scientist in the health sort of domain because I'm an epidemiologist and I use both SAS and R. But what I'm going to show you, you can do in R, and you don't need to worry that SAS doesn't do these plots because you can do the analysis, you can get the numbers out of SAS. And so I'll even show you that today with this Likert plot. Now, if you're an R user, you're probably, oh, it's good to see you, Sunil. Um, if you're an R user, you're probably familiar with the um, package ggplot2, which is a great uh, graphing package. And I call these non ggplot2 plots, but that's not technically correct. They're just not run of the mill ggplot2 plots. They, I think they leverage ggplot2, but I'm just getting technical about it. Now, if you download the slides, you'll see that there's um, on this slide, you have these links. Okay. And today, if I'm going to be going over what's on the second link, this Likert plot. It's a blog post that goes along with this. And it's if you go to that blog post, you can download the code and the data I'm using today to demonstrate. And then on the next slide, you'll notice that it says something about factor analysis. This pertains to the scree plot, which is, like I said, follow our company page. And when I post that event, you can come and you'll find out about this. All right. All right. So here we are in R. Now, if you go to that blog post on the Likert plot, you'll see that I've sort of organized the blog post in like step one, step two. I think I even brought up, uh, here's, here it is. So you'll see how it says, you know, kind of down here, like see this one, two, three stuff. Okay, that's what I'm talking about in this code where it says step one, step two. But I'm actually gonna run all this code and jump ahead to step nine because I want to first show you what I'm talking about. I first want to show you what this plot is. You know, when you're like doing like a cooking um, video and you want to see what it looks like after it's cooked first before you do the recipe, that's what we're doing here. Okay, so it comes out like this, but let me just stretch it out. So even if you're a SaaS user and you don't really use R, you'll see that this was kind of pretty easy. I just ran all this code and this came out and I'm stretching it out to make it look nice. Now, if I wanted to save this, I could go over here, file, save as. I usually choose JPEG. And then over here, I could just save it as a JPEG, right? But I first want to just um, interpret this for you, okay? So I'll show you the data set. But what this data set had was it was a bunch of Likert scale statements. As you can see here, this was the responses. One was strongly disagree. Two was somewhat disagree. Three was neither agree nor disagree. Four was somewhat agree. And five was strongly agree. And I actually took some real answers from a survey. I just made up the statements. These are just like gibberish statements. Okay. So I want to show you, and I just pulled out like five of them. You know, I was helping somebody do a survey and there were a lot more, more items. But I just want to show you how to interpret this, okay? Now, these five items, the reason they're in this order has to do with the results, okay? So let's look at the results. 
first, I want to show you this X axis. So see this zero in the middle? Then it says percentage 50, 100. And then here it says 50, 100. This green side is the agree side. So you can kind of see of the people on this side, you know, how many get to agree. Um, and here you can see that if you take this green and the light green together, it says 51% over here. That's what that means. And this is 36% for this one. So what it did was it first calculated that and then it sorted it in that order. So this first one here, this is the 51 is the biggest and then 36, 32, 30, 26. So the most agreed with one is at the top. So you can imagine if you're doing like a psychometric instrument and then these are like the five items on one of your subscales, you'd be like, I'd like to see if they're all sort of close or if they're kind of different. Because let's look down here, this one. So this is strongly disagree, right? And see this, the strongly plus someone, it, it's 60%. And what's kind of nice about this is you can really tell like, of the disagrees, most of them are strongly over here. And of the agrees, most of them are strongly over here. Okay. But I haven't really gone over this middle one. And this is the, the disagree over here. Like this is 40%. This is 36%. See this middle one? This gray shows you how many people said they they didn't they didn't have an uh that neither agree nor disagree and some people call that neutral but i like to put it neither agree nor disagree because sometimes you just don't have an opinion but see how like 30 percent were here that's kind of weird like people shouldn't be putting this a lot so they don't have a strong opinion sometimes that can be an issue so this is nice here so you can see how if you're Studying, if you're doing a bunch of surveys, I, I don't recommend putting all of your Likert answers into one plot. I recommend taking groups and putting them in. And then that way, um, I'm sorry, I don't know what's going on with my phone. Um, I, I recommend just putting groups of them in at a time so you can compare them like on domains. And then that way, you can make this visualization and it makes it easier for you to make decisions. All right. So that's the visualization. And now I'm going to show you how to make it. And I'm just looking over here to see if anybody's got any questions. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to just clear this console here and I'm going to start at the beginning. So this is R and you can set the working directory. I set the working directory to whatever we're doing today. Um, and then step one is I read in my survey data set. So I'm going to read this in and I'm just going to show you what it looks like. And it's called survey one. So what survey one looks like is it's got a study ID with this, this number that starts with 14755. And if I scroll down, it's got 47 um, people in it. And it, it's got five columns. They're called Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, Q5. And you just saw the legend. That's the legend of what they were asked. They were asked these statements and they had to rate them. Now, the problem I had with this data set, and I've had this before, is so imagine you ask a statement and it's a really awesome statement. Like everybody agrees with it. That means that it doesn't like, let's say five is a super awesome statement that everybody agrees with. They're going to answer to Q5, five or four They're or even maybe three, but nobody's going to answer one or two. And if you get the situation where nobody answers one of the levels, you've got to do a workaround for this plot. So that's actually built into this code. Okay. And it's kind of a kludgy workaround, so please don't laugh at me. It works, okay? And it helps you understand kind of how R works. So imagine that you're in SAS and you've got a, a ton of data or whatever. You could theoretically just trim out these columns. You know, like even if you had like thousands, like I think if you had a real million records, if you just trimmed out these columns, and you pulled it out, you could just do 
exactly. You know, read it into R and do this thing I just did. Okay, so what's the first thing we're going to do is steps two and three is where we design and make fake data. And this is really fun in R because it's not that easy to do in SAS. So notice how study ID is a column and Q1 is a column or whatever. Well, what we're doing for our fake data is just making columns. So I made a column called study ID, which is just a vector with a bunch of these nine um, uh, values in it. Why? Because then I can filter these out again. I know these are fake data. And see Q1, for the first one, I'm going to say every Q1 is going to say one, two, three, four, five. Like 99991 is going to say one, 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 one for each. And the next one's going to say two, 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 two for each. You can see what I'm doing, right? I'm making sure that each one, um, that each one has, uh, uh, that value in it just to game the system, all right? And then I'm going to take these columns and sew them together, or splice them together by using a data frame command into a, a data uh, frame called fake, right? So let's just make fake. All right, so let's uh, run fake. There's my fake data looks just like the real data, only I'm gaming it, so I'm making sure it's got the values in each of them. Now I'm going to actually bind, R bind or row bind, fake to survey one to generate survey two. This looks a lot like um, merging in, uh, in SAS, right? So we're going to just merge these together. And here's survey two, and see I've got the fake data at the end. Now, here's something that's not going to happen in SAS and happens in R. Um, right now, if I ask what class or what is the data type, like class, if I go, um, what is it, survey to Q1, it says numeric. We cannot do this plot with numeric data. We have to use ordinal data. And if you, you know, like one, two, three, four, five is ordinal. And so you have to classify it as a factor in R, which doesn't happen in SAS, right? So how you change, like you could change, let's say you had character numbers, number story of characters. You could change them to numeric using as numeric. Well, this is called as factor. So we create these new set of variables called Q1 underscore F for factor, which is the factor version of these variables. So that's what we're going to do here. And now when we see survey two after I ran this, here's the factor version of all of these. It looks the same, but when you do the class, like class survey two Q1 underscore F for factor, see it's a factor class. And you're probably like, okay, Monica, they look the same. Well, the problem is they behave differently, okay? The factors are going to behave like ordinal variables or like nominal variables. They're going to behave like categorical variables. So one means a category, right? So now the next step, step five, I create this um, vector called factor levels. Now these are going to be what ends up in the legend. Okay. So this is so if you had said neutral instead of neither agree nor disagree, then this is where you would do that. So I run that and I, it's just a vector that says these levels. OK, and I have to put them in order of one, two, three, four, five. That's how it knows. OK, now I'm going to shove the factor levels onto each of my factor variables. See the underscore F? Um, it's the same factor levels. I'm just shoving them onto, I always say shoving it because it uses this arrow. That's probably very rude, right? So now actually I want to so show you survey two because it looks a little different now. Remember how a minute ago, all of these, like these look like numbers and these also look like numbers. Well, now they don't because we basically, if you remember SAS's formats, like you can attach formats to levels of categorical variables. This is kind of the same thing is you can attach these factor levels to factor variables. It's like the analogous thing. All right, let's go to the bottom here. All right, so we've made it through. Now we're on step six. 
And in step six, what we want to do is remove our fake data. We had our fake data was there to hold the placers to make sure that when we did like Q4 factor levels, it wasn't missing one of these. Because if like everybody said strongly agree, somewhat agree, you neither agree to disagree, and we we're missing this, it would error out at the steps. So we prevented that with our kludge. But now we have to get rid of the fake data. So we're going to create survey three by keeping survey two only the study IDs that are less than this nine nine, right? So we'll do that. And I realize it's a kludge, but here we go. So now we know. You can see that at number of rows. Remember in our actual survey data set, we had 20, 47. All right. So now the only problem is, let, let me use a, a call names here. So call names, survey three. So we have a lot of columns we're not going to plot. Like we're only going to plot these factor columns. So the next step is to create survey four where we just keep the columns. Now, now notice here, we don't want study ID for the plot. We don't want Q, we don't want any of these. We want this one and these. And see this one and this eight? This is column eight and column nine, and this is column seven. So this is me saying, brackets, survey three brackets, I want all the rows, that's the comma, like everything, you know, that's why I didn't put anything before. I want all the rows in just columns seven through 11. Now, hard coding columns you want in your code is risky, but we're just making a plot data set so we can get away with it, right? So we'll do that. And then now when I do, um, let me see if this works. Say, hey, see, I, I used the up arrow, it worked again. Now let me see, uh, this is curve A. Yeah, so now survey four only has these um, these column names in it. All right, so those columns, but the, these column names are not what we, we want the actual statement to come out on the plot. So this is where I was using real survey data, just a few question or statements from real survey data. This is where I just replaced these var headings with just nonsense statements. And so I, I made these nonsense statements and called them var headings. And now I attached them, see this names? I made them the column headings. I, re I replaced Q1 underscore F with, I want to live in a world with unicorns. I, I think that's how it ended up. Let's look at it here. Yeah, so now I, I replace them with the, and I know that sounds weird, right? Like in SAS, you could never make a column heading. That's a sentence, <laughs> you know, but welcome to R, right? You get to break some SAS rules. Makes it feel good. Finally, we get to the plot. So remember when you're using R, you have to, if you're using a package, you got to install the package, right? So I already installed the package Likert. That's what we're using. And so we call it up with the library. Now, how how to you can see here, I'm running the Likert command on this plot data set that I worked so hard to make. And that creates this object P. Then I use this Likert bar plot command with all of these settings in it to generate this object a and then i plot a so this is super complicated i encourage you to read the blog post to figure all this out so you can see these are just um options i'm setting really like i think if i run p here okay so what if you p is just the um proportions that come out and then if i run this Liker bar plot on P, these are all these settings. I generate A, and then when we plot A, this is what we get, all right? And if you go, you can get all of this code and an, even an explanation of all of those options at that, um, uh, at that blog post. What we just talked about was like analyzing this Likert plot, like producing this Likert plot from survey data, basically it's survey data, right? So if you're in my audience right now, you've probably done surveys and pro you probably do research and you're probably used to like making a research protocol or making a plan and gathering data and then trying to do a plot like I just showed you with it. But 
nowadays, researchers like us are expected to actually know more than that. We're expected to like be able to analyze data from applications. In fact, somebody I was just talking to yesterday talked to me about one of these data providers you can log in and you can analyze encounter data. And you can analyze data from medical records and from labs at real hospitals. Real world data is what it's called. But that person, even though they're really intelligent, was very confused. Like they didn't know. They're like, Monica, I don't know what to connect. I don't know what data sets to connect. I don't know what makes sense. Uh, should I look at inpatient? Should I look at outpatient? What makes sense with my research question? And I was like, yeah. What if you're expected to analyze data from an application? It's really not that straightforward. So because of that, I came up with this workshop called Application Basics. Um, the big picture is our theme this month. So this is an online workshop with the learning objective to understand data sets from applications well enough to analyze them and produce results. And if you come to the workshop, you're going to learn about computer applications, like how these applications are designed, like the teams that design them and how the data are stored in the applications. You're going to learn the terminology around application development so you can start using it to communicate. And with this knowledge, you can break through communication barriers to get the answers you need to complete your analysis and be seen as an expert. So here are some details about the workshop. Um, again, it's called Application Basics, the big picture. And it's Saturday and Sunday, um, March 23rd and 24th. And each session starts at noon Eastern time and lasts about three hours. And it's an interactive Zoom online um, workshop. And a normal price for a workshop like that is about $250 to $750 per workshop when you have these two-day interactive workshops where you can network with data scientists. But lucky you, because you attended my Likert scale workshop uh, today, my Likert plot workshop, your cost is free. I have not found another workshop like this that has that delivers this information to a research audience. Um, and I have gotten a lot of very positive feedback from the participants. So I really would hope that you would sign up for our workshop and again, follow our company page and make sure you stay up to date about our um, events because I'm gonna show you how to do those other three plots you saw, and especially if you're into psychometric analysis, like making psychometric instruments or analyzing data from them, you know, I'm going to have something on factor analysis. So you're going to want to know about that. Next time you do a survey, you want to use, definitely use the Likert plot. It's really great for, um, it's, it's really great for, um, interpretation. So what will happen is, especially like Let's say you've got a product and you've got a statements about this product and they're all positive. Like the product was fun to use. The product was easy to use. The product was intuitive to use. The product was um, made me feel comfortable. The product made me feel confident. You can throw them all in one Likert plot and it'll sort it out for you. Like if the product did not make them feel comfortable, that's gonna be on the bottom, right? It really just helps you with the first pass of trying to sort out the Likert data. Like I remember I used to get Likert data and I'm like, well, what do I do? Do I just make the percent that agree? And what you're never supposed to do is make a mean out of it, <laughs> right, Sunil? <laughs> <laughs> that's the wrong thing to do because then you're not handling it as an ordinal variable. You're handling it as a continuous variable. It's a, what is it? A novice's common mistake. But then you're like, make, you know, I'm shaming these novices for making means out of ordinal variables. But that's what we do, right? Like if you go on um, Yelp or, you know, Uber or whatever, you see, oh, 4.5, I have a good driver. You know, you're not supposed to make a mean, <laughs> right? And so if I'm yelling at everybody, you're not supposed to make a mean out of it, then what are you supposed to do? So uh, the, this is my answer. You're supposed to do the like your plot. 
Well, thank you, everybody, for showing up today. I really appreciate it when you come to my live streams because I don't like to talk to nobody, and I just love seeing everybody's faces here on Zoom. And I hope you have a wonderful Tuesday and a very good week. Thank you for watching this video, which is part of the Public Health to Data Science Rebrand Program. If you are interested in joining the program, please sign up for a 30-minute Zoom interview using the link in the description.